Our scripture readings for this morning are found in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 19. With the passage in Mark being our background passage. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by the Satan, and he was with wild beasts. And the angels waited upon him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And then the passage in which we're revolving around today, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 and 19. For the love of Christ urges us on. Because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might, no longer, might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was recording the world, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses or sins against them and trusting the message of reconciliation to us. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. I am sorry, there is a fungus among us that's just tickling my throat. Today is Palm Sunday. From the passage that I used to open the service today, Jesus was preparing to make an entry into Jerusalem. This was during the season of Passover, and the population of Jerusalem and the surrounding towns that were within a legitimate or realistic day's journey would swell from their normal population up to six times their population. People would literally, literally be sleeping on top of each other in the streets. You would not find people camping outside the city gates of Jerusalem or outside the outskirts of the villages and the towns because it would be considered too dangerous. Predatory beasts and thieves and robbers would come and take advantage of them. You think of the most crowded mall during the Christmas season, shoulder to shoulder, and Jerusalem at the time of Passover and the villages would be worse. It was a time filled with expectation and anxiety, for Passover was the celebration, the remembrance of when God had liberated his chosen people from Egypt, from the slavery, the bondage that they had under the Pharaoh. Pharaoh took them through the wilderness in 40 days and gave them the promised land. If they believed that God was going to make his final act to save them, to uplift them, to make them the position of being above everyone else and truly be the beloved people of God they imagined themselves to become, it would happen at Passover. So when Jesus comes in riding a beast of burden, a beast of burden that has never had a burden, the climate was right. And they exploded with celebration. They threw more than palm fronds on the ground. They took off their outer garment. It'd be like me taking off my suit jacket. A suit that I've had for a number of years and don't plan on replacing anytime soon. Tossing it to the ground 
and letting some hoofed creature with icky, dirty feet trample all over it, potentially even cutting some of the fabric. This is how much their excitement took them, drove them, and put them into the mindset of what was going to happen this Passover season. Maybe Messiah would come. The anointed one of God to liberate them to the place that they believed they should be in. But that's after the three-year journey. That's after Jesus' ministry. That's after he's gone throughout the hillside, both in Palestine and in its bordered countries, and doing miracles, doing teachings, doing confrontations. They're all caught up in the hype of the celebration. I wonder sometimes if they understood the message that he was putting forward. And that message that Jesus was putting forward goes back to his time in the wilderness. For what is in his struggling, it was in his suffering, it was in his loneliness and abandonment, his doubt, that he truly learned who and what God was, more than the concept of a heavenly father, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who gave the Ten Commandments, the one who gave them prophets, judges, kings, the beautiful writings of the Psalms, the wisdom literature of Proverbs. I mean, that's all academic understanding. In the wilderness, in his brokenness, in his suffering, in his not being able to fend for himself because he had nothing with him, he was totally and completely dependent on God for his survival. Have any of us ever been in a position like that? I know I have not. And it's a hard thing for me to wrap my head around in my intellectual thinking, in my way of processing the world, in my way of relating to the world, because I always had some type of a contingency plan. I always had a backup of a backup of a backup. And if I didn't have that, I could usually think my way out of it. Jesus was in a position where none of that would work. He had to let go. He had to give up everything. He had to die of himself, the concept of who he was, who he was raised by Mary and Joseph to be, the belief and the concept that the people in his village had about him. He had to let all of that go and truly allow himself to be seen as the person, the creation, the one whom God had sent, anointed, and identified in that Jordan River. Have I blown your minds yet? Because what I'm doing is setting the stage. Sorry, Jesus isn't walking on my coat today. Today is the last teaching in this sermon series of Lent. And it is in this lesson that we celebrate that when we go through times of struggle, when we go through times of our own personal wilderness, like Jesus, it is a time of new beginnings. He emerged from the wilderness with the resolve to go forth and preach the good news. Did he have that before he went in? If he did, the scriptures would have told us. So the answer to my question is no. He was empowered and enabled in his time of struggle. Another way to think about it is that wilderness times in our lives are usually temporary. And I remember a retired pastor in a church that I served telling me that one of his favorite phrases in Scripture could be found more than 450 times in the King James Bible. The phrase is, it came to pass. That can be very good news if you're contemplating wilderness time because wilderness time comes, but it doesn't stay. 
It's not permanent unless we create a reality that makes it so. And then there's some other issues of health that you need to see a professional about. Times of struggle pass. Wilderness time always comes to an end and is always followed by a new beginning. According to Dante, written over the gates of hells are the word, all hope abandon ye who enter here. Sometimes we imagine that those words are written over the gates of the wilderness and struggles of our life, and we are tempted to abandon any and all hope. The good news of our Christian faith, though, that we should embrace and share, however, is that the wilderness is never the final destination, and hope is alive, even in a desolate territory dryness of our lives. Wilderness times generally mark the end of one phase and the beginning of a new phase in our lives. For our children who graduate from high school, we have a term for this. It's called commencement. The ending of one thing and the beginning of another. Jesus' difficult and lonely time of testing in the Judean wilderness gave way to a new beginning, the beginning of his public ministry. It prepared him and strengthened him for it in a way that perhaps... Nothing else could. New beginnings stand at the heart of the gospel message. No matter who we are or what we've done, no matter if the wilderness is our own making, God is present in that wilderness with us and can lead us through it and out of it. When we find ourselves in the wilderness of sin, guilt, separation from God, separation from others, there is a way out of the wilderness and a new beginning, and God provides that way through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. The Apostle Paul was an expert on new beginnings. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. In other words, you thought you were smart and you knew the law? Paul knew it better. You thought you knew how to apply the teachings of the law and the, the, the writings that went around it? Paul knew it better. He was of the best of the best in what he did. He himself understood new beginnings. He was knocked from his animal, struck blind, had to journey in his blindness to find Barnabas, to have hands laid on him, prayed over, a miraculous healing, and then a time to unlearn what he learned and learn a new way to apply it. He stopped being Paul the persecutor. That part of him died. And he became Paul the evangelist that we attribute a lot of our gospel writings, to, a lot of our New Testament writings to. He knew well the spiritual territory that we call the wilderness because he spent a great deal of his time there after he had given himself to Jesus. Paul knew the power of being made new and set free from the wilderness of a broken relationship with God and with others. So Paul wrote, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Jesus the Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. In other words, God kept making the first move. And if you think about the history of God as we have it recorded in our scriptures, God always has. Did Humanity create the heavens and the earth? Genesis says God did that. Did humanity generate all the life on this planet and all the elements that we find throughout the cosmos? God did that. Did God be able to create everything that we enjoy in this life? Or did we do that? God did that. Did God generate the Ten Commandments? Or did we do that? 
God did that. God is constantly moving, calling, saying, come back to me. And he did that in the beautiful movement of giving his son Jesus to us in this world. And this Palm Sunday is that last step of the process where Jesus is getting into the final movement. The board is being set. It's time for God to make his triumphant move. The good news of Jesus in our lives is that no matter who you are or what you've done, there's always held out to us the chance of a new beginning. In Jesus, we are new creations. Everything old has passed away. See, everything becomes new. We have this thing back here. Called the baptistry. We fill it with water. And when a person accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they go through a time of training, they go through the waters of baptism, and in that moment we join him in the burial and the death. When I do a baptism, and I take someone down into the water, making sure that they don't pull me with them if they're afraid of it, yes, I've had that happen. I say some very pointed words. You are buried in Christ through your baptism. And you are raised to walk as a new creation. You are symbolically washing off the things that you have given up that make you a sinful, wretched creature. You are wanting yourself to become new. You're wanting yourself to become changed. You're wanting yourself to have this hope and joy and peace that Scripture talks about. But now we're going to position our lives to allow it to flow. That's becoming new. Jesus told the story of a man who had two sons. One day the younger of the two went to his father and said in so many words, (coughs) excuse me, I wish you were dead. Basically he was asking for his inheritance, not at all appropriate since the father was still very much alive. The father gave his younger son his share of the inheritance, and the son ran away to a distant country where he squandered it all. All that money his father had worked hard to earn set aside for his son was just thrown away, satisfying the son's every whim, every desire that he could buy, even the friends he had. It was an awful thing to do. It didn't take the boy long to blow through his inheritance, and he found himself homeless and hungry. The young boy found himself doing the unthinkable. A good Jewish boy, he wound up fading pigs, the most vile and disgusting creature to the, to the Jewish people. And he found himself so hungry and broken that he wanted to eat the stuff that the pigs were being fed. He was in the wilderness. He came to his senses and he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and I'm here starving to death? You can find that in Luke chapter 15. So he decided to go home, beg his father's forgiveness. As he was approaching that familiar place that was once his home, his father saw him. And the father was so overjoyed, he ran to him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. What a beautiful image of God making the first move to run to us. Jesus taught us that God is like that loving Father. And if you are in the wilderness feeling separated from him, and perhaps you even ran into that wilderness yourself intentionally, even though it may be difficult to believe, God is like that Father and will run to meet you, welcome us home with open arms, ready to give us a new beginning. He will not hold it against us. A number of years ago, I had to take a, go through a number of uh, psychological examinations to go into the ministry. At the time, my school saw, thought it was pretty good to have students that were not only spiritually healthy, but also mentally healthy to be pastors, something I still think is a good idea. And in my assessment, it said, Paul, you're a forgiving man, but you don't forget too easily. I went, Nope. And my advisor, Dr. Vincent de Gregoris, said, 
you're going to struggle with that throughout all your ministry. You need to be aware of that. Thanks, Vince. <clears throat> and I have. Because we forgive and we say, yep, it's fine, but we still hold some type of ember of resistance, anger, and it just kind of quietly smolders in its place. And then we almost wait for an opportunity to lash out and get them back. There's a phrase for that in the world of psychology, one that is not appropriate to utter here, but you basically set them up and stick it to them. I have one of those types of personalities. And I struggle with it each and every day. Because as a new creation, that's not what God wants me to be. God wants me to forgive like God forgives. He forgives and he forgets. He doesn't hold the person who wronged me in bondage. Ultimately, the wilderness that we experience never has the last word. But what about that greatest wilderness of all when our lives in this world come to an end? What about death itself? Many of you know that my wife has had a number of health issues this past winter season and it has been trying and a little heavy on our household for those little food angels that have been making food and sending it to us. Thank you very much. It's been quite delicious. I'm not trying to jones for more. I'm just saying thank you. But there are moments, dark places, that she recesses into where she looks me straight in the eye and says, this is not how I want to die. There's still so much that I want to do. There's still, still so much that I want to experience. I don't want to die like my mother did at 48. Those are some heavy words as a husband to hear. But my wife and I look at this all very, very differently. And I'm not trying to say that I'm better than she is. I just see it differently. For I believe that a lifetime is from the moment you're born to the moment that you die, whether that's 120 years, 80 years, 60 years, or three minutes. We define a lifetime by the experiences that we have. And if you look at the true definition, it's from the moment where you have life to the moment where you leave it. And that concept of, of that we live not forever here, that all the knowledge, all the experience, all the awareness that we have will one day not matter. Because we will be in the full embrace of our Heavenly Father. If any of you have one of those running tick lists of when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God why this, my recommendation is to let it go. You're holding anger towards God. And just accept that the world is the way that God created it. The people are broken. They really need Jesus. We are the messengers that are supposed to deliver that to them. But when you get to God, when you get to heaven, none of these things are going to matter anymore. And while we can sit here in our faith and say, wow, that's awesome, that's beautiful, and wonder, we have moments in the wilderness of our mortality where that scares the living bejesus out of us. What about death? <coughs> the good news for us in our faith journey, in our wilderness journey, in our time of Lent, that even in the wilderness, death comes to pass. For in Jesus Christ, Paul observed, death has been swallowed up into victory. The good news of our faith is that even out of the wilderness of suffering and death, even out of the wilderness of pain of someone that we love, there is a new beginning. Death is swallowed up in the victory of Jesus, our loving Savior, our Lord, the one who will give himself on that cross, the one whom we will celebrate. Death does not have the final word. God does in the promise of resurrected 
eternal life. What's the point of having Palm Sunday and Holy Week and Easter if we don't have a faith that is based on that hope of reality that there is nothing in this world that can win except God? Brokenness, illness, disease, terminal illnesses, they are not punishments, they are not elements of testing. They happen to us, but they are opportunities to reveal our faith or to reveal faith to those who are suffering and struggling. Why? Because we are children of the risen Christ. And if Jesus hadn't died, why would we be gathering? What would we have to celebrate? What would our hope be? be in. I would probably be selling cars. I don't know. I wouldn't be doing this. But God made the first move. No longer wanting our sin to act as a barrier, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, that separates ourselves from God. His son entered Jerusalem on a beast of burden to give himself fully and freely to go through whatever suffering the world was going to throw at him in those final days so that you and I can gather here in this place right now and to celebrate, to give thanks, and to walk with an uplifted feeling that God is not only one who we encounter here, because of his son Jesus, we can take God with us out there. And every time we stop and proclaim that, every time we stop and rededicate ourselves to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, give ourselves over to God, a part of ourselves that's tied to this world dies. And we become a new, newer, new and improved, growing, 2.0 version, whatever you want to call it, we are growing closer to our Lord, our Father in heaven, who loves us, created us with such beauty and diversity, gave us gifts to be able to prosper this world through, to have comforts, to have wisdom, to have relationships, to have everything that we will need. But all those gifts and abilities were made possible by the death of our Lord and Savior, who back in the wilderness gave himself to God's plan. He was full tilt, 100% committed, no questions, no reservations, no contingency plans. God, I will do what you need me to do. He even asked God to take it away, and when God didn't give him an answer, he went, okay, I'll follow this through. Your will be done. In that moment, Jesus died a little bit of himself so he could be someone new, so he could truly be the Savior that God sent, that this world needs, that this world still needs. Death is not the end. It is new beginnings that gives all of us eternal life. Will you pray with me, please? The next coming days, O oh God, are the days that we call Holy Week. And while, yes, we will gather this week, this Thursday, to celebrate your son's giving himself over to be crucified, let us not look at it as, ah, oh, someone else won. 
but recognizing that it was a gift of his own free will. And we, being followers of your Son, of our own free will, need to be constantly giving ourselves over to you so that we can keep growing, so that we we can keep having new beginnings, new adventures, new ways of sharing the love that you have shown us. Remind us this week. Empower us this week. Allow us to ask questions. Allow us to struggle. Allow us to doubt. Allow us to recognize that we need you, O God, to be dependent on you, O God. Remind us and prepare us so when we gather again, we can leave this place with a hope with a peace that surpasses all understanding, and knowing that you are a God who loves us, you sent your Son to die for us, and your Holy Spirit, O God, allows us to feel you and brings us together. All because of your plan in sending your Son, Jesus, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. There is this passage that is quoted that says we are beautifully and wonderfully made and there are those that will sit there and interpret it and go hey look at me I got it all together I'm beautifully and wonderfully made but it doesn't say anything about how that happened we are not born into the faith Our tradition that we worship by says you give yourselves over to it by accepting our son Jesus as our Lord and Savior, which means we allow the things that this world has taught and programmed us to say, this is important, this is what you need, this is how you should be, to let all of that go and let God fill us, let God guide us, let God grow us, to be Not the people we should be, but to become the elements of creation God has called us to be. It doesn't come without some form of death, some sort of letting go, some sort of stopping one element of the journey and beginning another. I have not made it a secret this Lenten season Without that death, we would have nothing to celebrate. We would have no resurrection. We would have no understanding of the promise of eternity. And that's the hope. We're in a world and a people where death is dealt, is looked at as, well, that's the end. No, it's not. God has the plan. God has the place. God has the power to reach out, invite us, help us to grow so that we can be part of it when this life is at an end. That's what our Savior went through. 
And in a way, we will go through a little bit of the same. Between now and then, we will have struggles and ups and downs, and that's okay. Because our God is with us in our wildernesses, just like our God was with his Son through his. So as you stay put and stick around for the meeting, but after that, you'll go from this place. Take what you've heard. Take what you've felt. Think about it. Pray about it. If the Spirit calls you to, apply some of it to your lives. But as you all go from this place and wait for these things to be handed out, do not be afraid to let the world know you all are people, children of a loving God. Go in grace. Be filled with his peace. Amen.